morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to share with you some practical information. So when the conference ends at quarter past 12, we'll have lunch until 1 p.m. And at 1 p.m., my colleague Sheila and I will take you on a tour through this library. Uh, the tour ends at uh, 2 p.m. And after that, uh, those of you who uh, signed up for the Tesla tour, uh, we will gather uh, in the main hall of the library and then we uh, talked about uh, calling a taxi and sharing a taxi to uh, students uh, where our tour starts. So those of you who would like to share uh, a cab, we will share a cab. Those of you who would like to walk, we can also organize that. So there are two options that we can we can choose from one of these. And yeah, I think that is... We can organize during lunch. Yes, we can, yes, we can talk during lunch and we can decide which uh, option we will take. So. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, have a nice day and uh, I'll see you later. Yes? So if we um, if we start earlier, so if we leave the university library earlier, we can go to the Belgrade City Library and it just take, if you take the taxi, it shouldn't take us more than 10-15 minutes to get there. Uh, that's including the traffic, which is terrible at Belgrade sometimes. Um, so if we leave here earlier, um, we could manage to uh, visit the city library and be on time to the meeting point with the guide. Look, uh, if I would like to know something about you, all of you, uh, Serbian and others. They would like, I make two lists. If you put your name and the country where you're coming from, and if you are going to attend, they want just to know these three things. I make two lists and just be sure that you use your website. Okay? Is it alright? Okay. Could you do it during break? Okay, now we will start our um, the first speakers is going to talk about um, the living in uh, Irving, the Park County Local History Archives. Um, and she's going to tell us uh, a little bit about what the Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah. uh, my name is Christiana Giuseppe, and I'm a faculty in the Library of Information Science program at the University of Denver. Uh, before I started teaching future librarians, I was a librarian myself. I worked um, as a digital collections and digitization librarian at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where um, I was involved in digitization and also building um, digital, digital collections. So this project that I'm going to talk about kind of builds on my uh, practical uh, experience. I'll be talking about some of the uh, benefits but as well as challenges of preserving cultural heritage in rural areas where people who are involved in building archives often don't have access to uh, expertise of archivists or digitization uh, special specialists. Specifically I'll be talking about the uh, community archives in Park County um, in a remote area in, in uh, Colorado in the United uh, States. And this is a collaborative project where I'm working with the community archives, but also local government agency in Park County, and a number of my graduate students have been involved in this project. And two of my uh, graduate students, Michelle Shibor and Renata Bedar, um, were working with me and they actually graduated and I'm becoming successful um, uh, librarians, but they contributed to the project and uh, writing the paper, so I want to acknowledge them. A few words about Park County, Colorado. Um, it is truly that beautiful as it looks at this picture. I assure you, it's a beautiful area uh, in, in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, but it's also very remote, okay? I have a map just to show you how that county is placed in uh, Colorado. So it's actually not that far from Denver. It's about a two hour drive from Denver uh, to Fur Play, which is the major town 
in Park County. However, you have to drive through the mountains. And in the winter, or even in the spring, this trip is pretty <laughs> adventurous. So uh, I think that contributes uh, to the fact that this area is so remote. If you look at the map, the kind of marked area is Park County. It's actually not far from the famous ski resorts in the Rocky Mountain, like Bale, Aspen, or Keystone. It's like, you know, 20 minutes uh, drive, but it's really quite different than the uh, ski resorts. It's remote than swim to the poor area, actually, and not heavily um, uh, populated. So the major town is from Play and 600 people. Okay, the entire county is six, over, over, over 16,000 uh, uh, people. What contributes to the fact that it's so remote and rural is, is really the elevation. Okay, um, uh, for play is about 10,000 feet, which is 3,000 uh, near. So to be honest, it's not easy to live there because of the elevation and pretty harsh winters, okay? And winds are pretty uh, strong there um, uh, as well. So um, what happened uh, in terms of the history of Park County, obviously before the white settlers uh, came to the region of Colorado, uh, uh, there were indigenous um, uh, people there. Although not having populated as other southwest uh, areas of, of the United States. And again, it's because of the elevation. There was a Yucca nation, Yucca Indians, who uh, uh, lived in that area mostly in summer, so they migrated uh, because it was cooler than in other areas of uh, Colorado. But there were not too many permanent settlements uh, there. Uh, white settlers uh, started moving to that part of uh, Colorado in the mid 19th century, around 1859, where gold was discovered in Colorado. So the development of that area is really part of the gold rush. You know, the prospectors, you know, rushed uh, to to Colorado to discover gold, and in addition to gold mining, there was also silver. Uh, silver uh, mining. So this image is actually from the community archive and it's uh, an image of the mine that was in one of the little towns called, uh, called Alma. The mining lasted from again mid 19th century to the 20s and 30s. There were still silver mines. Actually the last silver mine closed in uh, that area in the 70s. Okay? But of course after the gold disappeared, people left the earth. But because of the rich history, not only of gold mining and silver mining, but also of railroads, because in order to support the mines, the railroads were, were built, and one of the major hubs was actually Como, not far from, uh, from uh, Fairplay. So there's a very rich history of railroads. So in the little town of Como, 20 trains stopped at the time of peak of the gold, uh, of the gold rush. There is a railroad museum there, there's a lot of reconstruction and documenting of that, of that history. And of course, with the prospectors, um, uh, towns and settlements that were developed, as you saw on the map, there was not a lot of development. Fairpool is the major one, Alma and Como. Como at this point has a population of 25 people. And in summer, there are perhaps 45 people who come and live there in summer, so it's not a heavily populated. There's no industry. The only occupation people actually have is ranching, and then tourism is big because people come there in summer to hike, to come, you know, and spend, and spend time in that, in that area. So community archives um, was built about 20 years ago by a group of volunteers who were interested in collecting and organizing materials that are related to the history of railroads, mining, settlements, and people who, uh, who lived uh, there. I have a quote from a kind of like a seminal paper on community archives, a uh, British uh, uh, archivist, Andrew Flynn, who is sort of analyzing the motivation why volunteers are organizing community archives. And part of that is that I think there is a certain like a turn in the history. 
when people are feeling that they are losing their heritage because obviously there is a loss of population, the, you know, the industry is, is dying, and in this case, the mining was there, and now there's really no industry in this case. So people are interested in uh, documenting the history that's at the risk of disappearing, you know, and it's really endangered uh, uh, history. So what happened about 20 years ago, a group of volunteers of local historian and amateur, amateur uh, historian uh, started collecting the materials and a variety of, of materials documenting the history of the region. Primarily photographs, um, but also they conducted oral histories, they collected maps, local newspapers, all kinds of historic records, both public but also personal, like uh, a marriage certificate, birth certificate, death certificates, uh, coroner's report. So there's a lot of materials that is gathered. Just to give you a scope of the collection, there's about 4,000 photographs that they collected over the period. They conducted 60 oral histories. So there's a lot of materials uh, uh, that were gathered. Again, they were all volunteers. Nobody had any archive or library training. So they sort of devised their own methods of organizing uh, the materials. And I have to admit that when I went there and examined the collection, I was really impressed with the way the physical collection was organized. Every photograph has a unique number, and every photograph has a caption. So they captured the material, and they built an index uh, for, for, for the uh, photographic collection. The other archival collections, unfortunately, are unprocessed. Uh, um, so, working with other types of documents that should be difficult in basically in archival, in archival uh, boxes. But as with any volunteer efforts, if you work with volunteers, you know it's difficult to sustain those efforts. Okay? So you have to have the next generation of people who are interested in continuing the archive. And this is something my lovely group of volunteers did not foresee. <laughs> so what happened is they either passed away or they became older and are not able to continue the effort. So one, a couple of the really key founding members died in 2017 and most of the activities sort of stopped. Okay? So what happened uh, is the local county government has a department of cultural heritage and tourism uh, sort of offered to take over the archive and house it in the new county building. Uh, people who work in the department are mostly historical, uh, work in historical preservation of buildings or have training in archaeology. They are not archivists. <laughs> okay. So uh, the director of the department reached out to uh, my program and asked for help, basically organizing uh, the, co uh, the collection. Uh, and that's sort of the whole collaborative project. Uh, started. So it's the archive as a partner, it's the Department of Heritage and Tourism, and, it, and my program at the University of Denver. The challenge is that there is about two hour distance, you know, and the location is accessible in summer, but then past that, driving there regularly, it can be, it can be um, uh, challenging. So uh, the archive was actually uh, housed in the historical building, which is a uh, old uh, county courthouse. It's a historic building that uh, the Department of Heritage and Tourism is located. But the archive was in the basement of that building. And as you know, most basements have water problems, humidity problems. So one of the first things after we did assessment of the collection, we decided that the <coughs> archival collection needs to be moved because some of the newspapers and, and other um, uh, historical materials were actually water damaged. Um, so part of the, the initiative was really organizing the archive, moving it to a new location, and then we started thinking also about digitizing um, uh, the, uh, the archive. So this is part of the relocation uh, uh, process. Uh, two of my students working with me there. Uh, in the spring, we conducted a needs assessment, so we drove there and we spent a day basically making an inventory and assessing the condition 
um, of, of the archives, and then my students wrote basically a plan, what needs to be done in order to move the, the collection, you know, what type of archival materials are necessary so they, uh, they would um, uh, purchase it. And then we went there for a week, actually, at the end of June, and helped to move the archive to a new location. The new building, I mean, we have a picture, is not that attractive, <laughs> to be honest, but it's a brand new building that other county offices are located. And the archive received three rooms. So they have like a small reference room plus two rooms for the archival collection um, uh, for storing, which can be publicly accessible so people can come and use it. What's the most important uh, factor is that it has environmental control. Okay, it's a pretty stable temperature and there is no risk actually of flooding or um, water damage. So we helped moving uh, the collection and we're also studying uh, digitization, which to be honest is probably the most challenging aspect, not because it's so difficult. I have background in it and I know what we are doing, but part of that is we have to drive there. You know, that's the only limited time that we can go there and spend time. We don't want to move collections between, although I have a lab at my school, it would be easier for us to, to scan in Denver. But there's always a risk in moving collections between, uh, between places so we go there and scan there. Um, uh, the county purchased a couple of uh, 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 photos, uh, photo scanners. Um, and the photographic collection, unfortunately, needs to be rescanned. So what happened over the years when the volunteers were collecting the photographs, they did scan, okay? As they were acquiring those uh, images from family members in the area, however, they used um, low quality scanners, but they did not follow digitization standards. So they created a very low resolution JPEGs, and the quality is horrible. They maintain a static website where they put the images. That's probably how they maintain them, <laughs> just to be honest, because they don't do justice. Um, so we are rescanning the original images. However, in the process of building the archive, they return some of the originals to the families. So there's no original in the archive. So it's pretty challenging, and we have to figure out what to do next in order to rescan those images um, again. And um, in addition to the photographic images and the selection of documents, we're also converting all histories. They were recorded on uh, audio tapes as a preservationist is that audio tapes actually are very serious uh, preservationist is that it, is it this integrates with, with time. So we started that conversion. Then we can do actually in Denver we brought uh, the tapes because uh, they were very good about uh, making multiple copies. So every all history has three sets of tapes. <laughs> okay, so some stay in Denver play and then we uh, uh, digitize the videos. And the plan is actually to build a digital archive, a searchable uh, archive. We are using Omega software, which is open source software used pretty widely now for building um, digital and archival uh, collections. So the goals are to expand access uh, to, to the collection and also basically to raise awareness and interest in the, in the park country. We are keeping the uh, uh, archival uh, digital masters <coughs> as well. This is a process we just started, so uh, I don't really, we just started building. This is something I will be doing with my students in the fall, uh, building metadata and building a searchable collection. Uh, Colorado also is a member of, um, is a, has a hub for the Digital Public Library of America. So I started a conversation about harvesting metadata from that collection into the Digital Public Library of America, so it will become widely Accessible. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. We have credits to my students. And I actually have questions for you. I know you want to ask questions of me, but I also would like to kind of get your perspective. And a couple of questions I would like to pose is really, you know, if you have experience working with community archives, what's primarily volunteer, and how do we work as like a professional and archivist in a way that we respect the way the collections were built, you know. So uh, I think with librarians and archivists, I can say that 
but they did not follow legislation uh, standards creating the images. And what they created, obviously, is not worth much. I will never say that to the community uh, members because they spend a lot of effort, you know, working on it. And it's really hard for me to say, you wasted your time, <laughs> you know. So there, there has to be a certain way of working and respecting what they did, but also creating long-term digital objects that can, uh, that can last. So if you have any advice and tips, I would really welcome <laughs> because that's a very difficult conversation for me uh, to have with the, with the community uh, members. And any ideas how to engage community and sustain the archive long-term Vaikushi ka khalsa, Vaikushi ki fate. Sashikal sahaya. Um, I just convert it in English and then I move on. So this basically means uh, glorifying the name of God, which is the truth, and it codifies the principles of Sikhism that it stands for. Now I take back everyone to the late 1600s in Lahore, where a butcher asked, do you accept the charges for all the sins that you've committed? The saintly soldier replied, No, I don't. But I welcome the punishment, whatsoever it is, with open arms. Now this was a saintly soldier who had a soldier-like aura, but the selflessness and the bravery for peace and truth. This dialogue between the ignorant future and the brave heart actually defines Sikhism in a sense, in a nutshell, for centuries. What it means is that to be a Sikh is to be a human. To be a Sikh is to honor the history no matter how poor it is. And to be a Sikh is to rise above the time and to be glory in unspeakable atrocities. A very good morning everyone. Today I, Sikhan Kaur, a law student from India, stands here deeply passionate about history and like I am a proud Sikh in servitude to my community and to narrate a demonizing account of atrocities which ravaged the community and, it's, and has its everlasting impact and uh, is in dire need of preservation. So I shall begin by describing So this is the holiest shrine of the Sikhs. This is the, 
this is implicated in Amritsar. Now, if you look at the demography of the country in India, this is the state of Punjab, right? And this is the neighboring country of Pakistan. Now, before partition, that is, before the two countries were created, Punjab was a big state. So it had it, it incapacitated, you know, Himachal Pradesh and these states as well. So when the partition happened, we were left with just, just this chunk. And this is where the violence unleashed and it spread across a lot, like a lot of states, majorly, uh, you know, covering a lot of uh, South Indian states as well. So I'll be explaining it later. Uh, it later. Now, Sikhism in its essence, basically Sikhism is the newest religion in the world. Um, in a nutshell, if I have to describe, it adopts the holy principles from two religions, Hinduism and Islam. And it interpreted the humane, the, you know, the, the, it interpreted the humane principles of it and it gave rise to a new religion, which was basically based on principles of humanity, on equality and to eradicate its expression of women. So this religion actually appealed to a large chunk of Indian society which was massively divided by the caste system, the brutal and the unjust caste system which was practiced by the Hindu religion. So essentially everybody is equal in Sikhism. If you even see the architecture of Golden Temple, it has four doors. So anybody from any religion is welcome. There is absolutely no discrimination based on religion, caste, or gender. Coming to uh, the political turmoil. Now before that, actually, uh, this community I was talking about suffered the most twice in the year 1947 when the partition happened and in the year 1984. I would not like to delve into the political reasons or the sociological reasons which led to the political turmoil, but in a nutshell, I would you know, just brief it up or sum it up for the knowledge of my beloved audience. Um, in the late 1970s, the central government tried to topple the state government in Punjab just to retain its supremacy, just to retain its governance there. So in order to do that, in order to topple the opposition party, they planted a militant. They planted a sort of uh, a militant to disrupt the governance there so that it is uh, the, the opposition party is brought to its knees. Now what happened in that process was that a lot of communist movements and other movements, they engulfed in this, leading to a lot of violence and mass killings of people of all religions. Right? It reached to a point where the, uh, where the central government had to order the Indian army to reach and to enter the holy shrine which is known as the Darbar Sahib Golden Temple as you can see it in the background as well. This lies damaged. This is the picture in June 1954. They were ordered to enter the premises and to, in order to flush out the militants. Now in the process of that what happened was uh, a complete blackout uh, and media curfew was imposed in the state. Then nobody actually knew what is happening there. And uh, as a result of which, a lot of innocent pil pilgrimage, pilgrims and people and innocent people lost their lives and were maimed and were brutalized and were, you know, all sorts of inhuman behavior was spelled out to them. Who had absolutely nothing to do with extremists and militants, which were actually planted by the government. This is just a glance of the horrors. I'll be explaining what led to the violence. This is basically um, you know, the Indian army and the ruins of, you know, they, uh, so, okay, uh, architecturally, if I have to tell, there are two uh, main places in uh, the Golden Temple. One is the Holy Shrine, where the sacred book of the Sikhs, the Gugran Sahib is kept. And that was also shot by the militants. So there are holes of bullet, bullet points are, you know, available there. And then there is a political speech known as the Akal where the administrative decisions of the management party, right? Both of them were attacked and uh, irreparable damage was done to them. So this is actually, uh, if you can see, uh, the, base, the, the, the physical appearance of Sikhs is very, very different from Muslims in the Sikhs, which is characterized by having a weak, a beard, a long hair, and tying a turban, which is actually considered to be a very, uh, a holy thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's considered to be a mark of self-respect and the sacrifices which are gurus and the Sikhs and the soldiers which made for the religion and, and the country as a whole. Um, if you see this, um, these are the violent mobs attacking a Sikh uh, by, you know, pulling his hair, which is considered to be the most inhuman and the most insulting act which could possibly be committed on a Sikh. Uh, I, I specifically describe this violence which happened in 1984, the first three days of November, as program and not as riots. And there are plenty of reasons for that. And I'll be giving you a legal insight as to how penological riots are described in the Indian penal law. But um, to, be, to begin with, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, I would 
say, as a revenge, the two sick bodyguards of the then Prime Minister, Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, shot her, uh, and uh, you know, as a as a mark of revenge, that they wanted to take for the kind of acts that she had done on the community. Uh, after that, what happened was that there was an administrative and a political connivance between the police, the state machinery, the law and order machinery, and the political party, which was then ruling, and that led to power unleashing unfettered violence, unaccounted for violence. So what happened was that, um, uh, you know, what happened was that uh, since the state, when, when, when violence, when mobs sabotage the state machinery, they have access to the information as to where the Sikhs are located, where the Sikhs live and where the properties are. So they had the list, they had like every, like, you know, the, the mobs who were actually, and it's an interesting thing to note that these mobs were actually not Punjabis or the ones living in North India. They were, they were the ones who were picked up from slums, they were given money, they were given ransom that if you create, if you unleash, if you create terror, you will be paid. So they were actually poor people who were picked up and they were given the list and hence sick people, uh, sick families, sick men, women and children and young boys, they were picked up from their homes and they were slaughtered and uh, still there are so many uh, colonies in Delhi like the Trilopuri they lie, you know, haunted, I mean they lie dilapidated to, to, till this day uh, Moving on, the state shroud is the magnitude of the culprits Now, as I said that there was an administrative and uh, administrative compliance connivance between the state machinery and political, the ruling political party because of which the state successfully managed to shroud the actual magnitude of the crime and protecting the culprits. Even to this day, uh, politicians who laid siege to the Gurdwaras, the holy shrines of the Sikhs, are now elected officials and they hold constitutional posts in our country. And um, as, I did, uh, as you can see, this is just one point I would really like to uh, add because it is massively entwined with the entire purpose of the presentation which is needed, is that, you know, legally rights are considered, it's just defined in the Indian Penal Law as four or five people, let's say if they, you know, just burn down the, a bus in, in a public space, like I am just showing an example. That is considered to be a more violence or a riot. But a violence which is happening over three days with so many brutalities, with widespread sexual violence, with, you know, maiming and disfiguring and all sorts of uh, brutal crimes which are committed at, at, on such a large scale. And we do not even know, I mean, there was a Forbes uh, magazine article which said that what happened in 1984 was actually then related to brutalities which were committed on Jews in the Second World War. So we don't know what the exact number of, you know, atrocities were, some say 10,000, some say 8,000, but the government is still stuck on naming it as 2,000. So it cannot be called as rights, they are genocide, they are, you know, they cannot be fitted into the definition of a traditional rights or ordinary more violence which just erupts. It was a very, very organized state crime which needs preservation. Now I'll be talking about the problems which are associated with preservation. Now this, this is one of the cornerstone of my entire presentation. Um, after the violence in 1984, from 1985 onwards, till 1995, which happened like approximately 9-10 years, entirely in the state of Punjab, just there was a president's rule and there was, every Sikh was viewed with the apprehension of he or she being a military, being a Khalistan, right? What happened was that the police subsequently, very, very systematically, they started picking up the, the youth. They started disappearing them, which led to mass formations. Now, very recently, and I met the lawyer who was working on, extensively on this project, uh, they are now documenting a lot of families whose young members were picked up just on account of they being suspected on the basis of being a militant, but that was not true. They had no reasons to back them up. Even in the criminal justice system, they say that an accused is not, is guilty if, uh, until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So you cannot just pick up a youth and just say that he is a militant. What happened was, as a result of this systematic prejudice, discrimination and inhuman behaviour of the state, 8,257 Punjabi sick men and youth, they were picked up and they were mass cremated. They were brutally tossed in police custody and they were mass cremated. What happened after that was even worse, that their families were not given death certificates, they were denied, they were, their bodies were not you know, handed over to them. And as a result of which they did not obey to any remedy or any opportunity provided by the state, right? Um, the, 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 the courts and the local government agencies also adopted a very hostile attitude towards dealing with this entire scenario because it took so many years 
happened, whatever cases of forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings of the mass killings, which were registered outside the state of Amritsar and Gurdaspur, which is where the blue star, uh, the siege on the Golden Temple happened, we were not registered there. Because, you know, they are most likely to be militants, so this was the rationale which was given to shock off accountability. Uh, moving on, there is a massive identity crisis which comes up when, we, when it comes to preserving and speaking out. And this is where the role of libraries come. Because libraries, as someone yesterday said, it is not a passive institution. It is a lifeline of civilization. It is an apolitical entity which can help in preserving, in documenting, in narrating what violence, what past unspeakable brutalities were committed on the community people. So that it stands as a testimony that this shall not be repeated. I understand there are a lot of technical problems in calling out uh, you know, a, a three-day stretch brutal organized state crime as genocide because there are a lot of technical legalities in calling a genocide. There are two things, accountability and repatriation. What happens is that it has, the state has to declare that okay, this was a genocide, this was an ethnic cleansing against a particular community and this will not happen again. None of, which, what ha uh, none of this happened in 1984. Hence, we need libraries and you know, organizations who preserve these, I mean, the, 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 what happened in 1984 and the aftermath. Like the lawyer I mentioned, he left his job uh, in London and he came back, he has stayed for 13 years in India, just documenting families in Punjab, the Ravish families, and as a result of the 8,257 Punjabi youth, 50,000 people are, were left to fend for themselves. In fact, I would say that uh, you know the identity crisis, uh, which comes, like for example, if I'm a Sikh, right, and if I choose to speak for documenting the victims of 1984, I will most likely be seen as a Khalistani or as a secessionist or as a separatist. Wishes to overthrow the government, or I will be most likely be slapped with a, you know, a sedition charge because I'm a Sikh and I choose to, you know, speak up against it, or I just very like purely organically I just want to preserve it. I will most likely be seen. I will be labelled with a, I, uh, an identity will be plastered upon me by my by the state because they still want to shirk off responsibility. Uh, moving on, uh, the need for preservation is in space uh, by the advocate media over these years because the media was actually, you know, again in excess of the state government, they justified the, the, the what happened, the flushing out of the militants, what happened, you know, they, uh, they tried to justify it and they, want, they demonized this entire community. And uh, these were some of the first early reports which were published by the very, uh, I would say, fearless NGOs who decided to, you know, they said that uh, it was, it cannot be solely called as communal violence, but it was something much, much more beyond the that. So we can say that assassination was just a plot. The crime was being planned much, much before that. So it was only one journalist, Mr. Brahmachanani, who was also slapped with sedition, who was there when this Operation Gustav was happening, and he documented all those pilgrimages, and he counted them, he placed the number between 500 and 1,000, that they were dehumanized, the turbans were removed, they were forced to crawl on this. On the, uh, shrine, uh, on the shrine and the army people were actually openly uh, roaming around in the shrine with their shoes on, which is considered to be a very uh, great disrespect. Uh, I would really, really like to uh, highlight the people who have been the force behind documenting and behind unearthing the truth. This man actually deserves uh, applause because he, you know, he was the first person, his friend got actually and he's actually uh, presented himself to be a government official and uh, he, and he, was, he was instrumental in uh, contacting the municipalities where the mass formations happened. So he was actually, he was the one who brought to light what is happening about the forced disappearance as I mentioned. 8,157 Sikhs were forcefully mass formated. And then there's a Supreme Court advocate, I just up, who uh, represented a lot of cases of compensation. And these are the victims who never, never bowed down to the cruel legal system and they stood truthful to their testimonies of what they saw at that time. These are some of the books if you want to mention, uh, I mean if you want to read. Uh, Strangely, there's some politics which is in this book, I would say. Uh, no, in this book actually. It relates a completely contrasting opinion justifying the attitude of the government towards the Sikhs. But I, I not only as a Sikh, as a human, I feel what happened. Yes, the Palestinians, they are not justified in their demands, they are brutal. But just for the sake of them, we cannot 
slaughter an entire community, you know, um, just because they are in minority and you know they don't have much political representation. So these are some of the recent articles, and you can just go down on Twitter or scroll, and you can see people have shared their experiences, their own accounts when they were students, what happened, the kind of blackout, what happened in Delhi, etc., etc. Uh, migrations and asylum are also one of the crucial uh, outcomes of this program. What happened was that the Sikh community heavily displaced from Delhi to other parts of the country. You know, some migrated to other countries, some moved into Punjab, new cities like Mohali, where I live, Chandigarh, they were set up so that you know victims and people who fled as a result of the violence can be rehabilitated there. Now what happened was, I think, and it, it makes sense as well that the problem of drugs and the problem of violence is for some social, the grave social or the evil social problems can be associated, can be traced back to the violence which happened uh, in 1984. Because when our sole bread owner or a guiding light or a pit or, or a head of the family dies, there's no one to guide him. So that leads to you, you know, following wrong paths. So it actually uh, devastated and uh, sort of left a, a community in poverty, so to say. Uh, the idea of preservation, now I put in certain examples. We have the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons in Kashmir and Dalit camera. These are one of the pivotal uh, documenting agencies which work for documenting the, uh, documenting the forced disappearances and the movement's caste-based movement. I'm just like, putting an example, something of a uh, preservation, uh, the need for preservation can, the inspiration can be drawn up from them, that they have done some fantastic work in that regard. Also, we have the Khalsa Aid, which is uh, the World Level NGO, which is working and provides relief to war from areas and devastated areas. They have also created an exclusive page known as Love Fly Exhibition. You can also financially donate to the families whose houses were burned, whose properties were burned, and you know, they were not given the new search case or whatever. So, yeah, this is uh, the idea of preservation, which becomes very, very strong in light of so many discrepancies existing to this day. Lastly, I put these questions for the floor, which remain unanswered for too long, and I cannot. I, I mean, I cannot find an answer to these two questions, which is whether what happened in 1984 can be socially or politically can ever be called as a genocide, and secondly, whether this process of preservation can ever be devoid of uh, this entire political facade which is created that you are a secessionist or you know the sort of uh, unscrupulous identities which are plastered upon people. So just, uh, I created these two handouts. If you want to have a look, you can. These were some of the, uh, you know, the images of crime. You can see uh, abandoned villages, uh, you know, and these trucks uh, full of sick bodies which were transported from the Gurdwaras. And then, most importantly, the wrath of irreparable turmoil which was unleashed. Uh, it shows that the, the, the Golden Temple Library which was actually in store of so many rare Sikh manuscripts and books and holy books which were signed by the Sikh gurus themselves were also burned down. So there was a significant amount of damage which was caused to the libraries as well. So in light of all of this, I feel that the, that the whole idea, the whole manner of preservation becomes very, very imperative. Uh, you know, libraries, as like I said, play a huge apolitical role in preserving these, these histories so that this entire preservation is not just limited to documenting or anything of that sort. The entire purpose is to give justice, to give, uh, to give a solace, some sort of credence to their problems that, okay, if the state has denied, the legal system has denied the justice, there is an institution, there is a fearless institution as a library which is not passive. Uh, and it is an active uh, institution which is willing to preserve, to listen to you. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.
you could be giving them to try uh, and uh, tell you the story of the Lucky Lady statue. Uh, the Lucky Lady statue, uh, a small uh, iron made statue, uh, brought um, uh, from the United States, from America to Romania. The statue could travel with your hand in the 1930s. Um, it, it was uh, uh, a story of, uh, it was a time uh, when uh, every, uh, everywhere there was economic and financial crisis. And Johan, who wanted to be immigrated uh, uh, a few years uh, before, couldn't make uh, his fortune and he was about to turn back uh, to Romania. But he brought with him this statue because um, it, uh, uh, he considered it as a symbol of uh, what he found there. And um, uh, he, want, he had uh, shown it to all the family and related as um, uh, saying that, look, I was there in the land of possibilities. Um, and his dream was fulfilled by uh, his uh, granddaughter, wanted to study uh, in the United States and uh, now uh, she is a teacher of psychology in New York. Uh, she has five children and she lives there happily. So, uh, but the lucky statue remained in the family as a symbol of uh, surviving uh, difficult times and learning uh, lessons, life lessons, and just uh, a treasure uh, of important times. So this is only one um, story uh, of uh, what we gather during the European migration project in Romania. Uh, here we have uh, another story. The lady came from Canada uh, to uh, Romania to keep the legacy of uh, studying um, in Sibiu as her parents did. And uh, she, uh, here is uh, her contribution uh, at the Sibiu International Theatre Festival. Uh, so we managed to gather uh, many interesting stories uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, they, they can be found in the European Migration Digital Archive, uh, a project that was organized by Europeana, Europe's uh, digital cultural platform, and uh, 40 partners across uh, Europe uh, in 2018. Uh, we managed to uh, gather 600 stories and more than 1,000 objects were digitized on this occasion. Um, actually, <coughs> 18 collection days were held in 12 countries in 9 months. Uh, Serbia was included, so we had here also a, a nice uh, campaign. Um, why 2018? Because we all know it was the European Year of Cultural Heritage uh, with the slogan, Our Heritage, where the past meets the future. Because uh, the European Commission considered um, it a wonderful opportunity to encourage people to explore Europe's rich cultural diversity and mostly to reflect on the place that cultural heritage occupies in all our lives. Uh, so we held our um, migration uh, collection days in Sibiu in July and it was the sixth uh, campaign out of this 18. Um, and we gathered interesting stories from uh, Germany, Romania, United States, Canada, Italy, Bulgaria and Ukraine. Uh, in terms of what kind of object did people bring, uh, they, they brought 
anything. We can send from photos to drawings, books, certificates, uh, even clothing and uh, uh, sound recordings. Um, this kind of object were collected and gathered in our uh, CBU campaign. And uh, uh, speaking of uh, topics, uh, they range from remembering happy times from childhood. This is an old embroidery, uh, 100 years old, traveled from Romania to the United States. Uh, remembering happy times of daily life, like uh, traditional dances and uh, songs. But a uh, major topic was food. Um, traditional crafts and food were uh, made everywhere all the collecting days. This is a Bulgarian uh, man who was trained in Italy uh, to be a pizza yolo and he actually uh, makes pizza and traditional pasture in Romania uh, today, so quite a travel. And he brought his tools with him uh, right from Italy, just to make it in the traditional way. Of course, another important topic is clothing and traditional costumes. And here is the lucky lady statue, uh, which I have told you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, because it's very important uh, as a symbol of important life experiences, but also very important testimonies about historical events were gathered. Soviet invasion in general, it's in the World War II times. Or the persecution in prison in communist times in Romania. What we have here are some letters. Sewed um, pieces of shirt in prison by Maria Vize, a Romanian um, belonging to the German minority, was imprisoned for the only kid that she received a letter from Germany and she stayed in prison a few years. Uh, there were hard times for her. The censorship was complete. Uh, they didn't have uh, even a piece of paper and a pencil to write a few uh, lines to their beloved one. So she, uh, this is the only way she, uh, so she cut her uh, shirt and uh, seal this message for her mother. These are important uh, testimonies. And um, in terms of why it's important to share our stories, I should mention only a few uh, <coughs> remarks of the contributors. Uh, somebody says it is always important to record contemporary history. Somebody else said we can learn from each other and we can also learn to respect and cherish our common European values and cultural heritage. And uh, it is important knowing history as it was from first hand testimonies is important for actual and future generation. And in this way, we can all contribute to the collective knowledge of history. Uh, this is a way of developing identities uh, because one person said, even though my migration experience look minor, they are very important to me because they defined me as a person. And somebody else uh, told us, that you can take very few things with you in a suitcase, but very many in your soul. And we become even richer in the new places where we live. So, uh, <clears throat> somebody considers that it's important to share uh, in the history in order to preserve the historical memory of my family. And, uh, something that we in Europe are so united in our diversity that it is worth knowing all our family uh, stories. 
And if you can move up to that uh, corner, 